Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Kimberly Mingo. I am with Rent Spree. And in this webinar, the rental opportunity in real estate, we're going to talk about some various techniques that you can use to, um, to improve your real estate business, and specifically by adding rentals into the mix, which might not be something that a lot of agents uh, will consider, but I think there's great opportunity out there and certainly something that you all as real estate professionals want to take advantage of. And so in today's session, we're actually going to cover a lot of these things here. I've got them written out in the agenda. And um, so we're going to go through a little bit about just what the market looks like nowadays, um, how we're going to consider uh, rent, finding rental leads. There are lots of different sources out there. And I know that your broker provides you with a lot of great resources and tools. Um, but I just want to uh, summarize some of the things that you can do if you haven't already been doing that. We're going to talk about some marketing ideas. And then um, how can we at Rent Spree support you as the agent when you're working with rental uh, properties, rental listings in general. And then, of course, the goals and the key takeaways that I hope you will take away from the presentation is having a better understanding of the value of rentals um, and adding it to your business and um, developing some new strategies on how to work with and find the rental leads in your marketplace, um, working on building a campaign, a marketing campaign to strengthen your business um, and strategies to connect with your community, and of course, um, how to utilize the Rent Spree platform in its entirety. Um, oops, clicked on something here that popped up accidentally. Um, so the state of our real estate market, what exactly is going on in our current marketplace? Um, as you know, with our buyers and our sellers out there, they are challenged with a lot of things that's happening in our current uh, world. Um, first and foremost, I know this is not new to you, but rising mar mortgage rates is certainly a concern when you're working with buyers. Um, they've actually lost some of the buying power with the mortgage rates going up. And uh, since um, early this year in January, we've seen the mortgage rates pretty much doubled. And so I know when I refinanced uh, about a year and a half ago, something like that, I refinanced my home at three point like 3.2%. Um, and now it's almost 7%. And I believe it's actually 7.3% is what I saw this morning when I checked um, the rates. Uh, declining inventory levels. So this is uh, definitely something that we're seeing. Not only is there a um, an effect in the new builds, a lot of builders are really not able to deliver a lot of houses as they have in the past, but because of those mortgage rates, it's really kind of a trickle effect down the road. Those uh, sellers who had initially planned to sell and move on to their next home, of course, can't find the next home, and so their house can't be um, can't be occupied by a new owner. So the, the level of inventory in general has declined. Uh, rising home prices, of course, everything kind of factors into this as well. Um, in general, we're seeing home prices have increased 260% in the last 30 years. While we're looking at wages, uh, wages really have only increased by about 52%. So it really does put a hamper into our traditional model of working with buyers and sellers. So I pulled this um, earlier this week on the weekly national mortgage rate trends, just to kind of give you an idea of where mortgage rates are currently sitting. Um, now, hopefully they will come down by some. And for those of us who have been in the market for a, a while, um, including April that we mentioned earlier, you've actually seen the ebb and flow of the uh, the, the mortgages. So um, I remember I was actually thinking about this when I was looking at the long-term mortgage rate tables. When my parents bought their first house back in the mid 80s, interest rates were at about 12%. And so, you know, compared to what it has been over the last couple of years and where it's going now, it's typically not too bad. However, if you're looking at it three years ago, two years ago, compared to now, it's doubled. So there's a lot of those uh, types of mortgage rate factors that will affect your buyers within the next six months or so here and what decisions they're going to be making. 
Um, I also found this really nice chart regarding building costs. And so when you're looking at those new builds, um, the building costs in general went up significantly, especially in the last couple of years during the pandemic. And uh, this gives you a really good visual of where it is at uh, today. This is really just going over the last uh, two and a half years. Um, so this does affect the cost of new builds and homes in general as people improve, make improvements in their house. And of course, they want to get more out of the house due to those um, renovations that they're adding in. So market update regarding your rentals, uh, renting in general, um, all of that stuff that I mentioned earlier is really just giving you an idea of what's going on with your buyers and your sellers, how it's affecting them. Um, but when you really take a pivot and take a look at your rental market, um, this is a great opportunity for you to really embrace that into your business. Um, the target audience that we're looking at when we're talking about renting are really millennials. So the millennials are the largest generational group. Um, they are going to be those people who are in the roughly 26, 27 years old, up to about the early 40s. I think it's about 41 or 42. Um, they are, in general, community-oriented. They like the freedom of moving to different areas and exploring different experiences. They're also environmentally conscious. So that type of audience most likely are going to choose flexibility and renting over a fixed living situation uh, for whatever reasons. There could be um, there could be um, family reasons for it, but it just in, as a generation in gen. Uh, over overall, they're choosing that flexibility and the ability to work in different places and meet new friends and live in different cultures and different areas over having one house where they're going to stay in for the next five to 10 years. So some key factors that really affect this group is, of course, the home pricing. We talked about the increase in the home prices and the increase in the mortgage rates. That may actually deter a lot of them from purchasing um, on top of everything else that they that they value in their life. And however, we also have to think about rent in general has been increasing as uh, so that will affect your renters and that generation. And um, there are some other factors such as um, commissions. Uh, they're not really sure about how real estate works. And so they might think that there's commission um, involved for them. Uh, bidding wars and rental competition. There's a lot of competition out there in the rental market, just like there is when you're representing a buyer and they're looking to purchase. Um, the rental competition is fierce in some marketplaces. So these are all of the different challenges and factors that may affect your rental clients. And, but, you know, the good thing is I like to kind of educate people about what's going on in general, because really, it, the more you know, the more you grow, right? And in this business, you're always going to want to pick up new nuggets and and add that into your knowledge base so that you can actually pivot and change your business as needed. Um, I also saw this chart when I was kind of uh, uh, doing some investigation online. And this is a really great one. I'm happy to send this to you if you want to, uh, to add it in your resources. But the cost of renting versus the cost of buying, um, there is a great gap between the two. And the reason why I bring this up is really, you know, obviously your focus is going to be working with those buyers and, and sellers, because that tends to be where the larger commissions are going to be. However, if you think about those specific uh, groups who are not ready to buy, there's still great opportunity there to work with them. And this might be one of the reasons why they're not buying, right? So there's still going to be a lot of costs associated with owning uh, a home versus just being a renter. Um, in addition to all of the other uh, emotional aspects of things, the monetary aspect of it is very vast. And when you see it visually like this, it does hopefully help you understand where they're coming from. Um, so building a lasting relationship in your business is really important in order for you to stay relevant. And to stay relevant in the real estate game, you have to think beyond what the traditional model of uh, real estate was. And really, traditionally, real estate agents uh, targeted the buyers and the sellers because, again, I mentioned the commissions, right? The larger commissions that you sell a $100,000 home, 3% of that 
is a lot larger than 3% of a $1,000 rental. Um, however, in slow markets, you know, sometimes you're a new agent or you're new to a certain marketplace and you're just um, building your business, you have to consider all sides of real estate, which includes adding in the rental uh, transactions. Uh, this is your time to shine and educate those renters if you're looking to help them get on the path to home ownership, um, providing that they want that, right? You can also be there as their trusted resource during a time where they might not be ready to settle and make a, a permanent home. They can be there, you can be there to help them during that journey to find out where they need to go. And then once they are ready to settle, they're going to look upon you as that trusted resource who helped them along the way. And then really, you need to see the value in all real estate transactions. And this can be, of course, the buyers, the sellers, you're going to have your investors, you're going to have your relocation folks. Um, and then you're, you're going to have those renters as well. So all sides of the real estate transactions are going to be great opportunity for you to not only build your relationship, but to also sustain your business during the rough times and the good times, right? So this is where you can be in it for the long term. So finding rental leads. I'm going to ask this question, but obviously, since we're not um, unmuted and we can't have a, a back and forth flow in the conversation, I just want you to think about this. How many resources are available to you? You have resources from your broker. You have resources from your association. You have resources from your MLS. How much of those resources are you taking advantage of? Okay, so how are you learning about those various resources? Are you learning about those various resources and are you utilizing them? So where do you find rental leads? A little bit about my background. I actually spent the last 19 years working with the multiple listing service in the Baltimore metro um, region. And a lot of what I did was teach. So I taught agents how to use the MLS system. And in the MLS system, up my way, it includes a very robust public record database. Um, and it was pulled from the various counties that was basically within the footprint of that MLS. And so one of the biggest things that I always mention to agents is this is a tool that you're already paying for. It's a part of your MLS. Take the time to learn it and take the time to utilize it. There's a wealth of knowledge that you can glean from public records. Um, now, you all are in Florida. I'm not too familiar with the Florida uh, public record system. But if you look into it from your MLS standpoint, I would bet there's a ton of data there that you can access and you can um, export and do your analysis to find uh, uh, opportunities for leads you know, whether they be buyers, sellers, investors, what have you, you're going to have a wealth of data in that MLS. Now, once you grab a database, however you do it, even if you go out online and, you know, some people purchase databases, I don't recommend that, especially if you're a new agent or you're just uh, starting out in a new area because it does get expensive. So look to your current resources first. But once you have built a list of your prospects, one of the easiest things to do is to start going out there and getting yourself known in whatever neighborhood you want to break into. And so if you're a shy person like me, you're really not too comfortable with the cold calling, or maybe you just don't have access to phone numbers, right? If you have access to mailing addresses, you can always prospect by sending a good old letter. So a prospecting letter. What is a prospecting letter? A prospecting letter is literally a letter that you're going to write, you can type it, you can handwrite it, but this is where you're going to start to build a relationship and introduce yourself into a community. Um, and this is also where you can add things to demonstrate your value as a real estate professional. So you can pull stats from your MLS and plug it into a prospecting letter, you know, a really simple overview stat of the community. You can also get relevant community information, such as upcoming community yard sales. You might want to post things like, um, you know, if, you, if your community is going to be hosting any holiday event, 
just list it out in a very useful format in this prospecting letter and start sending it out to that community that you want to break into. And the key thing about the prospecting letter is it needs to start from somewhere, right? Even if you're just gonna write a simple thing like, hi, my name is Kimberly Mingo. I am an agent with XYZ Brokerage. Um, you know, you are, I live in the XYZ community, whatever it is, just wanna let you know, these are some upcoming holiday information, something simple. And you'll want to send that prospecting letter out repeatedly. So how often is going to work best for repeat, prospecting letters? I would say if you're introducing yourself to a new community, I'd start off with a letter, follow up with something else, maybe a postcard or maybe another, another letter within the next two weeks. So as you send the first one, two weeks later, send out another one, wait another two or three weeks, send out a third one. And then once you get to about four or five of these every two weeks apart, you can start to pair it back to maybe now it's going to be every three weeks or every four weeks, right? Um, the key thing is you want to introduce yourself first to the community. Sometimes they're not going to read the first one. They're going to read the second one. Perhaps they pick it up just to look at the stats. But eventually your name is going to be recognized. And they're going to start expecting some information that's relevant to them, relevant to the community, and some things that might be valuable to them. You never really know what is going to ring a bell with somebody, right? It might be some community fun things. Maybe they have um, kids and they want they like things that, that list out all in one place, a calendar of social events for kids or things that are happening at the local library or even local school happenings. That would really, really demonstrate your value within that community. So that is exactly what a prospecting letter. You really wanna build that relationship with your prospects, the people that you want to, to work with. So now, now let's kind of switch gears a little bit with under prospecting also, what can we do to really um, add a lot of emphasis in that prospecting letter? Well, first and foremost, how many of you all like to get a letter that just says, hey neighbor, or you know something generic like that, right? Or they don't even mention a name. You probably won't like that because at that point, you know, oh, they're just sending it to everybody. It's a mass mailing, right? Or if we get an email that doesn't have something personal to it, we know right away it's a spam. So make sure you personalize that experience. What I usually like to do, and uh, I, I am the first to admit I have the worst handwriting, but when I want to personalize something, I do make an effort to handwrite the person's name or handwrite their delivery address on the envelope. It really makes it a little, a little bit more special, um, especially because nowadays we're getting we're not getting a lot of handwritten letters or notes anymore. So when you get something handwritten, it does feel a little more personal and a little more special. So try to personalize that experience. Um, start it off with a instead of saying dear neighbor, you know, dear. Mr. Smith, if you happen to meet Mr. Smith and you know his first name, then it's gonna be Dear John, you know, whatever it is. So make sure you track that and personalize that experience for that audience. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about circle prospecting. Um, some of you may actually be aware of what that is, but some of you might not. So we'll, we'll come back to the circle prospecting method in a second. But the last one and the most important thing that I wanna get in here is anything that you decide to do you want to track. So this is just an example. I'm talking about the letter. But if you decide to do a marketing campaign online, whether it's through social media or you're trying to do an email campaign instead of the uh, traditional mailing, um, you could track your marketing. You know, when you're doing things electronically, it's great to track certain um, aspects like what subject line gets the most clicks right? How many uh, people are actually opening those emails? So those are things that you want to know so that you know what works best, which form of marketing works best for you. So circle prospecting. Circle prospecting is where you're going to use something in your business to trigger additional um, relevant information that you can then send out. So for example, Let's say that you or your office gets a new listing in this great neighborhood that you've been wanting to break into, right? So you're going to send a letter to everybody in that community saying, "We, I'd like to introduce our latest listing. It's at whatever, 123 Main Street. 
um, come and check it out. You know, here's some more information on it. Here's the link or whatever it is that you decide to put in that letter. So you're using that to generate interest. And then when you're there at that property, you're going to continue. Let's say you're going to hold an open house in a couple of weeks. You may want to send out a little notice or you may want to go around door knocking and let people know that you're going to be holding an open house for 123 Main Street and please stop by and say hello, right? So you're gonna actually use that to generate additional um, interest from people in that community. So these are really, really good uh, ways to kind of really tweak that prospecting to make it a little bit more special for that community. So three pillars of prospecting that I want you to keep in mind. We talked about this already, but you wanna build a list. So building a list is not just a list of any random people. It could, however, you may want to start to narrow down that list over time so that you're building a list of your ideal target audience. So this might be perhaps it, you want to uh, target investors, right? So you're going to pick a neighborhood that has a lot of investment properties. You're going to export out a list of all of those property owners, and then you're going to start to do whatever outreach you're going to um, decide to do to reach that audience. So your outreach can be cold calling. It can be door knocking. It can be sending emails, working with social media. You can even send letters. And whatever it is that you decide to do that's most comfortable for you, do it and do it consistently. So if you reach out every two weeks for, let's say, five to six you know, um, times in a row that you can pair it back to like three weeks, four weeks, whatever it is, but just continue to do that and make it a point to continuously uh, work on that outreach. Now, all of the outreach that you do, whichever one works for you, you're also going to track. So this is where you're going to test out different methods. And in turn, you're also going to track how well did that method work? So let's say you decided to do six months of cold calling, okay? So if you do cold calling for six months, you're gonna track when did you do the cold calling and um, how many people did you actually reach during that session and continue to do that. Every time you go out and cold call, you're gonna to start to see a pattern. And you know, perhaps it's actually easier to cold call in the morning <laughs> or midday or whatever it is. Not great to call during dinner time, right? So those are things that you need to know in order to hone in on um, on that, uh, what will work for you and uh, that method that you decided to do. So make sure that you're tracking it and capturing the metrics. Now, there is actually a fourth side of this, which we're actually gonna spend talking about, uh, spend time talking about over the next few weeks. It's um, really having some type of a database to, to, uh, to collect all of this. So you're gonna have a CRM system to kind of collect all of the metrics and track everything that you're doing. So we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Building a drip campaign. So what exactly is a drip campaign? If you think about it, when you turn on your water faucet, really, really slowly, what does it do? The water drips out, right? If you have a leak in your faucet and you leave that drip going over time, you're going to easily fill up a bucket and then a larger bucket and then a larger bucket and so on. So the idea with a drip campaign is that you're going to get your name out there a little at a time, but it's going to build momentum. Okay, As long as you do it consistently and you do it over a certain time period, usually a longer time period. It's not going to work with one or two mailings. You might actually have to do it for six months, eight months, a year in some instances. So you're going to create a drip campaign. Um, if you have a CRM tool, uh, first and foremost, who here has a CRM tool? Let me just ask that. Okay. So what is a CRM tool? A CRM tool is exactly what it says there. It is a customer relationship management tool. Now, a CRM can be as robust or as simple as it needs to be. It really depends on you and how you work, okay? some For some people, a CRM tool is going to be something like an Excel spreadsheet and the calendar and reminders on their phone because technology-wise, that's about all they can handle right? As long as it allows you to track things, to set reminders, calendars, uh, uh, calendar, um, what is it? You can set calendar events and stuff like that. 
That's really what it is, okay? Um, so you can create a customized marketing campaign where you can then use it to connect and nurture with your renter clients. Now, a really, really robust CRM tool may actually have built-in verbiage into certain types of campaigns that you can spend thousands of dollars on a really, really nice tool that actually gives you all of the, the email verbiage that's going to go out. And it's actually going to do it for you. You just basically tell it how often and when you want to go out and send it to this group of people. And the system actually does a lot of that stuff for you. That's going to be very expensive. If you're willing to put a little time and effort into the content that you're sending out, you can pretty much use any reminder system to as long as you're using it consistently. So you can achieve success by creating time-bound series of emails that contextually provide valuable information or calls to action. So calls to action are very important. If you're sending out valuable information, you know, like that you consider valuable, right? Recipes and a list of events and all that stuff. You know, it's all great information, but you want them to interact with you. So that's what a call to action would be. So a call to action might be maybe you present a really light um, graphic on how, what the stats are in a certain in a certain neighborhood, and then you say, you know, call me to uh, to get your current home value or whatever it is, right? So you're asking them to do something. So that's where the call to action is really important. You really need to go into all of these mailings and these campaigns with a purpose, all right? So the time-bound series of emails is where you're going to uh, pace them with a certain, uh, a certain time uh, tied to it. Um, you can track open rates with a really nice CRM tool. You can also see click-through rates. So click-through rates are where they, they see the subject line and they actually click on it to open it, right? Or if they, they open it and there's another call to action button um, that, they'll, that you're asking them to do, if they actually click through that call to action button in a lot of these fancier CRM tools, it actually would tell you that as well. So the click-through rate is very important when you're looking to assess how effective certain campaigns are. Um, and also CRMs can help you easily categorize your emails. So it's not just all gonna go into your inbox, right? You're gonna have it separated out and categorized by different folders or what have you. And um, so the CRM tool that I have used in uh, the past when I worked with the uh, MLS up here is Salesforce. Some of you may actually recognize Salesforce. It's, no, it's, work, uh, it's actually very well known in a lot, a lot of companies use it. Um, however, it's a very expensive tool. It's not specific to real estate. It's just more of a sales relationship manager. Um, there are a lot of real estate related CRM systems out there. Uh, I can't even begin to tell you because everyone's going to have different technology levels and different needs. Um, but certainly there are lots of different tools that you can explore. Um, and if you if you check around the office, there may be agents around who can recommend certain things that they use. Okay. Um, simple things like constant contact is a great emailing um, tool that allows you to send out these camp emailing campaigns and they'll they'll give you analysis and click through rates and all of that stuff. So those are things that you can incorporate when you're creating that uh, drip campaign. So we've also put together a sample workflow for you. So this is a 12 month workflow. The first the first thing that you're going to send out would be something along the lines of, um, you know, if you're working with a renter and you want to put them on a drip campaign so that you can nurture them as a lead moving forward, the first email to them might be, um, you know, congratulations on um, the, your new home at, you know, whatever, ABC Main Street, right? Um, the, here's a list of different things that you should do when you first move in. and um, in, in my area, and I'm sure it's the same in Florida, but there is a, a checklist that a renter would go through uh, with the landlord and they indicate, you know, if there are holes in the wall or certain things aren't working or whatever it is, um, so that they know what was there when they first moved in. Okay, so you might want to remind them about that. You may also want to remind them before the move in to turn on the utilities. 
Um, perhaps there are move-in fees with the community that they'll need to pre-arrange, things like that. You can kind of add into that initial touch. Um, and then within that one through four months, uh, you can then start to add certain um, information that's tailored to them based on what you know about them, right? So when you get to know a renter, you're going to know what type of person they are. Perhaps they're here for work and it's an 18-month contract. Then you kind of get an idea of where they might be in the future. Um, so this is where you might want to start adding things such as market trends and statistics about an area uh, for them. And you're going to just kind of add that into um, the interval of that workflow within that first one through four months. And then the next five through nine months, if they are the type who have told you in the past, oh, we'd love to buy a house, we just can't afford it, or we'd love to buy a house, we want to find the right community, you know they want to buy a house. This is where you're going to start to nurture them with all of the buying things. So you may have to dispel some, some myths, perhaps, for them. You can give them some home ownership facts. You know, you giving them something that's relevant to where they are at that stage in their life is really going to be impactful and will make a, uh, will resonate with them. And then in the final three months or so of their lease um, expiration date, you may want to start uh, you know, hammering in a little bit more, right? Depending on what you know about them. This is where you can introduce your mortgage lender. You can talk about loans. You can talk about down payment programs or buyer programs in your area. You may even want to start to talk about the credit improvement. I would actually add that a little bit earlier in the stage, depending on their, their credit history, right? You might want to kind of pull that in a little bit earlier, but that last final three months of um, that lease stage, that is where you're going to hammer in all of the, the other things that they might not have considered, okay? So this is a sample of what we came up with as a workflow when you're trying to nurture a renter to become a buyer. Definitely something that's worth exploring. So some ideas for content. So what is important to renters? When you really think about it, there are lots of resources that you as a real estate professional can provide to renters. So straight up there on the left-hand side, moving services. Maybe you know a great moving company, right? That would be a great time to tap into your network and introduce that moving company to them early on. Um, perhaps you have... Um, you know somebody uh, who owns the local furniture store. You know, if they're looking to purchase a few pieces here, why not introduce them to that person? There are also some online services that you can look into. Move Easy and Updater are all uh, newish um, companies that have come out to help ease the moving services market. Um, so those are things that you can use, but definitely put together a list of resources with all of your network, your vendors and sphere of um of uh, vendors in your area that you can include as your list of resources for renters. Um, renters insurance, now this is something that RentsFree provides. We um, have a company that we work with that allows the renter to get a quote and purchase renters insurance if they don't already have it. A lot of times they can purchase renters insurance directly from their insurance company, you know, the same one that insures their car, motorcycle, whatever. Um, and then you can also provide a really nice inspection uh, checklist. And this is something I, um, I, I would imagine your broker has available to you. If not, it's usually available in your, your forms um, uh, program. They might have some type of a walkthrough checklist for rentals, but this is definitely going to be very important um, for them because they want to note anything that was um, in the property prior to them moving in. Okay, and that will help them, that will assist them during that move in process. Um, so some other content ideas, this is really you, this is where you have to understand the renter and where they're coming from. So a lot of times when people are renting, these are really very common types of questions that they may have. So everything that they're hearing on the news about home prices and mortgage rates and all of that time, they're going to ask you, well, I don't know if it makes sense to me financially. I might not have a down payment. 
you can come in and say, hey, our, our state has a great down payment assistance program, or you know, I know a, a company that can provide you with that or whatever it is. You can provide them with a, a rent versus buying analysis. Um, if maybe they're hesitant about buying in this marketplace, this current marketplace is now a good time for them to buy. You know, look beyond the doom and gloom and send them some information, some articles about, you know, this is a cyclical thing. Every uh, 15, 20 years, real estate kind of goes into this cycle. It always comes back out, especially if you're in a market where real estate pretty much is always going to be um, a, a good bet, right? Yes, there may be dips here and there, but in general, it's a good investment. Um, is buying feasible for me? You know, for them personally, how does it affect them? Maybe they have um, special loans that they need to get or you know, they need to work on their credit. These are way opportunities for you to pull in your mortgage lender and have them have a conversation with them. You know, do a real uh, sit down moment with that person to really truly understand how you can help them. Connecting with your community. So this is super important. Where do you actually start in all of this, right? The easiest thing to do is look around you and start with your local community. So your sphere of influence, I know uh, real estate agents, the very first thing they probably hear when they go to their, uh, their real estate classes is work your sphere of influence. So the SOI, your sphere of influence pretty much works in any sales model out there. You're going to focus on attracting business from the people you know and the people you meet socially, okay? So they're get, the reason why this works is because people you know already know you and trust you. And even if they themselves are not looking for uh, to go into a real estate transaction, they might actually be comfortable recommending you to somebody that they know. And because that person knows your, your friend or your, your uh, sphere of influence person, they're going to trust them. Okay, And therefore, because you're associated with that person, they're going to trust you. So working that sphere of influence is super important in building your business and building your leads. Make sure you work with them. Connecting with landlords and owners. So how do you connect with landlords and owners in order to help them rent out their vacancies? Uh, well, you can turn to social media. You know, a lot of times social media, it's good and it's bad. You know, if you're on Facebook too much, it's a time suck. We really don't want that. However, if you go in with a purpose and you actually build out a social media platform that is effective for reminding your sphere of influence who you are and what you do, this can really help expand your business into getting the word out into those landlords and those owners in the area. It will also, the way that you work social media can be very beneficial because the more content that you post that's going to be relevant to that community that you're trying to reach, um, the more times it's going to be shared and it's going to basically, you know, you've heard the, the term go viral, right? I'm not saying that your posts are going to go viral, but it's going to reach a larger audience if it's something that's relevant to that community. Um, you can also connect with previous clients. So if you've been in the business for a while, you most likely have a really good book of business that you can reach out to and remind them that uh, you're there to help with investment properties. You can help a person find a rental. You know, nothing is beneath you because everything is real estate related, right? And we, we want you to be the expert in real estate here. So don't be shy about connecting with your previous clients um, to see if they have investment properties or if they know anybody who is looking to acquire investment properties. Um, all right, so this is a good one too. If your brokerage does not have a property management division, you can connect with a local property management company. A lot of times, you know, you have long-term landlords and then after 20, 25, 30 years, they want to kind of downsize their portfolio. And if you get in good with a local property management company, they might refer you to that person, right? I know a great real estate agent who can help you with that. So make sure you network with local property management companies. And I will also say a lot of times, if you uh, put yourself out there and don't be afraid to do it, you can actually hold community workshops. I actually have a friend who's a broker up here and he does um, uh, investment workshops at his office and he gets a lot of community um, consumers 
attending those workshops. And, you know, even if they don't end up being investors in the, uh, the, the short term, the long term they will, they will always refer their friends if it was a great workshop. So don't be shy about doing things for your community and reaching out to them. Connecting with renters. So renters are not going to be big business for you in the sense that you're not going to make thousands of dollars per transaction. However, think of renters as a really good opportunity for you to nurture. And also, you know, any opportunity is going to lead to other opportunities, right? So the same with working with renters, when you want to connect with renters, you need to be where they are. So social media is great. You can offer specials or showings to family and friends for rental properties. You can host in-person or online classes for renters. Again, this is kind of going back to my, my broker friend. Um, he does a lot of these open classes and they're open to the community. It's not open to just his agents. He invites everybody. He posts on, on, on Facebook and everybody is welcome to attend and they're all free. But this is a great way to expose uh, the people in your community uh, maybe do a class for renting versus buying or, you know, or how to find rentals in a certain marketplace, right? If you're in a very, very hot rental market, it might be extremely competitive. You might actually provide some tips for renters. Um, you can provide marketing materials for uh, businesses and schools. You know, yeah, as cheesy as that may sound, it does work because, again, you're working that network. You want to get your name out there. Um, so these are all great ways that you can connect with renters. Um, unlocking rental opportunities with Rent Spree. We actually at Rent Spree have a great all in one rental platform for you. So we do everything from the, uh, the screening portion, we provide an online uh, application, we do tenant screening, transunion reports are provided to you. Um, we also have a built in acceptance and denial process, along with electronic uh, signatures. We also offer on the front end of your, uh, your journey here, the marketing functionality. So there's a great agent profile that you can build out and connect to your social media platform. Um, there are also really nice professional looking listing pages that you can create for all of your active rental listings and you can share on social media. You can add to other websites. It attaches to your agent profile you, so you can just share one page and everything gets disseminated out there. Um, we also provide rent estimates. So if you're working with a, um, a landlord and they're looking to see how much to price their rental at. You know, a rent estimate is a great report that uh, is available that you can generate for them. Um, and then on the tail end of the rental journey, there's the lead nurturing, the client management side of things. So all of this can be found within the Rent Spree platform. Um, just a little image to show you what an agent profile can look like. You can really um, make this as nice as you want it to be at your headshot, at an image of you know, your local area. You can flesh it out with all your experience, certifications, languages you speak, specialties that you have. And then um, when you share this on social media, it goes out with all of your contact information. Anybody can always reach you. Um, if you have any active rental listings, you can build out what's called the listing pages. So this is where you can upload videos, you can add photos, you can put in all the details about the property. The listing page includes a apply button where it syncs up directly with the online application that Rentsbury provides for you per property. And then also if you built these listing pages, all of your active rental listings that have listing pages will also actually roll up into your agent profile. So everything is nicely integrated into that profile for you to easily share um, online. Um, I just have a, a little time to do a quick demo. Um, I do have a more in-depth demo um, on another video that I did for you all about six months ago. So you can always check out that video. Uh, just for the sake of time, I wanted to uh, just share a, a few things about the, um, uh, the system here for those of you who are not, uh, hang on here, I, I stopped the share, but I can't really get it to um, go back to the, oh, I think I can just do this. Yep, here we go. Okay, so 
First and foremost, your rents free account is free. We've partnered with your broker to bring this to you. So if you don't already have a free rents free account, you'll want to go to rentsfree.com forward slash location. And uh, you do also have it in your intranet, I believe. Um, so you can click through on there, but it is rentsfree.com forward slash location. Um, you'll claim your free account and then you'll be able to go in and start working with Rentsbree. If you need to start screening tenants, there is a start screening option button right here. You can also go into the menu on the left-hand side, go into the My Listing section, add a property in, and then start screening from that property detail page. I'm just going to start without a property. So I'm just going to do start screening as screen new tenants. And then here you'll notice I can attach a specific property if I already have one in place that I want to screen, or I can create a new one right on the fly right here with this link. I can also say, eh, I want to add a property later, but for now I just want to start screening, right? So if you do that, it's going to take you to this screen. And from here, you're just going to add um, who's going to pay the screening fee. Um, the applicant or yourself typically is the applicant that pays. Now, for your company, your company charges a different fee for the screening report. So ignore the 38. This is the generic one that Redspree uh, charges. Um, if you don't need any of that to come back to you and you just want to run everybody through an application, we do have an application process for free that you can put out there to consumers. And so from here, you set whatever you want. You're going to go into next, and then this will give you different ways that you can share the apply link out to your consumers. You can text or you can email. You can also copy this link and share it through social media or anywhere online. Um, you can also print a one page uh, handout, which looks like this. It's got a nice QR code on there. Um, so if you're hosting an open house for a rental property, this might be a good idea to have um, the, the flyer available for people to either take or they can scan that QR code and start the application on their phone. So once you have all of this, uh, once that person um, applies and they get everything into the system, then you're actually going to receive, and I do have a couple of screenshots of the, um, you're going to then receive the full rental application back within the rent spree system. You'll get an email pretty much as soon as they hit submit, you'll receive an email from us saying that there's a report available. And it will give you the full rental application. So everything that they've supplied there, it will also, if you decide to do the screening portion that's conducted by TransUnion, you will see their credit history, which gives you all of the open trade lines, any collections that they've got, any bankruptcies that have occurred um, that will pull up for you. You'll also see the criminal background also provided by TransUnion, and you'll also have eviction related proceedings. So if any of that applies to that person, you'll get all of that information and all the details on that report. Okay, so that was a quick, quick, quick demo of the Rentsbree product. Again, just a reminder, I do have other videos posted within your intranet on a more in-depth demonstration on how to utilize the Rentsbree system. You can also reach out to me if you want a more one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, service on how to use it. If you have any questions for me, feel free to reach out. My email is Kimberly M at rentspree.com. Again, my name is Kimberly Mingum, your Senior Client Success Manager. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm gonna stop the recording, but I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. You have a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to pop them in there.